Hi, today we're going to read Chapter 21 of Chains by Laurie House Anderson. If you remember at the end of Chapter 20, Isabel had gone to sleep after having sweet uh, milk and gingerbread that Miss Lockton had made for her and insisted that she have. You know that Isabel was a little suspicious about it, but uh, was actually quite happy to have it and really enjoyed it. So then she went to sleep. Let's see what happens in Chapter 21. Wednesday, July 10, 1776. In my dreams, I stood on a sandy beach, my back to the sea, the moon over my left shoulder. An enormous map was unrolled at my feet. The roads on it were marked with velvet black ink, rivers a pearly blue, mountains a speckled green. It was a map of a country I'd never seen before. Just as I opened my mouth to call for Ruth, who always tagged along in my dreams, a thick mist blew over the beach. The roads on the map twined and twisted round each other, hesitating when they rose up off the paper. No longer roads, but thick eels with amber eyes. They crawled out of the map, and I feared they would bite me. They pondered me for a moment, then slithered down the beach and into the water. I awoke with a start and flung aside the blanket, looking for the eels. There were none there, nor in the potato bin. Ruth wasn't there, neither, and her side of our pallet was cold. She was gone to the privy, no doubt. I needed to visit the same place. The sun was already in the trees when I stepped outside. How had I slept so late? Ruth! I called, walking down to the little building. My nose wrinkled. The Locktons would need to dig a new privy hole. The seat was empty. Ruth, I knocked on the door and it swung open. The seat was empty with, with a few flies buzzing in the stench. Two blue jays in the sycamore tree called loudly. There was in the distance sound of officers shouting orders on Broadway and the clatter of cartwheels, but no Ruth. I made, a quick worth, I made quick work of looking in the garden. The back entry to the stables was locked. She could not have gone out that way. The gate on the street was closed, too, and the latch too high for Ruth to reach. Had Madame already dressed her, taken her on a call? I thought, a thought slid through me, quick and slimy, like a cold eel. I ran to the kitchen door. Becky! Becky! She came out of the pantry as I flew through the door. Where's Ruth? Oh, Becky looked down at the worn tips of her shoes, then turned from me, away from me. Her eyes were puddled and red-rimmed. I can't find her, I said. She was gone when I woke. Have you seen her? Becky took the jar of flour down from the shelf. You know where she is, don't you? She moved the lid and stuck the scoop into the flour. Tell me! Becky shook her head, her head from side to side. I should have started the bread earlier, she said, pouring the flour into the bowl. The wet air will ruin the loaves. That's my concern. I should have stayed and baked into the cool of the night. She dabbed her eyes on the sleeve and measured out another scoop of flour. But madam, she sent me home. She said she wanted a quiet house last night. No baking. She looked at me over her shoulder and the eel squeezed out all the air. No, I said. I wouldn't have gone if I'd known. No, no, no. I backed away, shaking my head. She didn't. She wouldn't. No. Isabel, don't. Becky followed me down the hall, trying to control her voice. It won't change anything. What's done is done. Ruth, I screamed up to the staircase. Stop, Isabel. Becky grabbed my arm and pulled me backwards, clamping a flower-covered hand over my mouth. You can't storm around here like a banshee. Madam will beat you bloody. Me too. I pushed her hand away and I wiped off the flower. Where is she? Where did they send her? She's gone, Becky said. Gone? Gone where? Becky studied her shoes again. Sold. I stopped hearing right. No more buds, birds or buzzing flies or grandfather clocks marking time. Sold? I repeated, no, she's not. They didn't. Becky's eyes filled again. Yes, she said quietly. She did. I paced the hall. No, I slept too heavy last night. Didn't notice when she woke. She wandered outside. We need to find her. She could be lost. She could have taken ill and fallen. Becky watched me go to and fro. The sweet milk madam made up. I figured it contained a sleep potion. Knocked you out cold so they would spirit her away. I'm dreadful, powerful, sorry, but they sold her away from you. It made no sense. I would have known. I would have woken, fought them off, killed whoever tried to take her from me. I took care of Ruth. I promised Mama I always would. Becky's face shrank down to the size of a coin. It sounded like she spoke through a long wooden pipe. Madam was returning to the carriage when, from the carriage when I, when I arrived this morning, she said. Told me not to worry about the milk spoiling no more, that Ruth was healed headed to Nevis, sold to a physician's family. I shook my head trying to clear my brain pan. Where's Nevis and how do I get there? Becky's face grew larger. You need to sit down. I'll get a cloth for your head. You, this has to be right shock to you. Where's Nevis? My voice echoed off the walls. West Indies, Becky muttered. The islands? 
All of Mama's terrible stories of slaves' life in the islands flooded back. Ruth can't cut cane. She'll die. She'll die in a day. My feet started to run for the front door. Wait! Becky grabbed my arm to prevent me from running off. I questioned Mano about that very fact, questioned her right close I did. Not to cut cane, said she, but to be a housemaid in a fine house, a physician's house, so they'll care for her should she fall. She's lying, I said. She's a spiteful, hateful liar. A door opened from the second floor. Becky, Madame asked, has someone come to call? No, ma'am, Becky said in a false high voice. Madame came down the stairs, one hand on the railing, the other holding a sheet of paper, half covered with writing. The paintings of her dead ancestors on the wall watched her. I did not appreciate interruptions when I was communicating with my husband. What is the matter here? Nothing, ma'am, Becky stuttered. I was giving the girl her directions for the morning. Madame looked down without seeing me. She looked at my face, my kerchief, my, sheath, my shift neatly tucked into my skirt, looked at my shoes, pinched my feet, that pinched my feet, looked at my hands that were stronger than hers, but she did not look into my eyes, did not see the lion inside me. She did not see me, the me of me, Isabel. I saw her. I saw all the way down to her withered soul. I walked up to two steps. Did you sell Ruth? You will not address me in that insolent manner. Her voice shook a little. Becky wrung her hands. Come, Isabel, you need to peel the potatoes. Would Madame like some tea or coffee? I took another step up. Answer me, you miserable cow. Did you sell my sister? Madame backed up a step. Her letter fluttered to the bottom of the stairs. Her ancestors hung silent. Stay away from me, she said. Get back to the kitchen. She's five years old, I rose up another step. She's a baby and you sold her away from me. She swallowed hard, her hands quivered. I wanted to grab her by the hair and throw her down the stairs. I wanted to throw her out the window, beat her face with my fists. I wanted her blood to splash the painting, soak the walls and the wooden stairs. Isabel, Becky he warned. The sunlight coming through the window was rosy red and I took the next step. I was almost close enough to reach her. Isabel, Becky tried again. One more step and I can have you hung, Madams whispered. I held my breath. There was a click of metal on metal. Becky had opened the front door wide, and a hot wind from the street rose up the stairs, flooding, fluttering our skirts and causing me to turn. Madame grabbed a painting from the wall and threw it down on my head. I raised my arms too late, and the frame crashed into me. The blow made me adulpated and weakened my knees. Madame ran upstairs, screaming like a house of fire. Becky dragged me down the steps and shoved me towards the open door. Run, she screamed. I ran out the front door for the first time. People walking under the shade of the sycamore across the street paused at the sight of the slave running away from a mansion when a woman was screaming. A man called after me, you there, girl. I ran straight down wall. I didn't worry about escaping notice of soldiers or strangers, just flew over the cobblestone as fast as I could. The red fog slowly rolled out of my mind and there were more shouts behind me and people turning to stare at the cause of the commotion. I didn't dare to take the time to turn around. Past City Hall, across Broadway, I leapt over the remain of the century fire. I bumped into a gray-bearded soldier wearing a homespun shirt, and I startled a man carrying two live hens by the feet. One of the hens broke free in an explosion of feathers. The man shook his fist and called out for someone to stop me. I ducked down one street after another, trying to find a way to the river. But the army had erected barricades at the end of most of the roads to keep out the British. I was penned in. The shouts behind me grew louder and closer and I darted down an alley, turned blindly towards the right and ran smack into the barrel chest of a giant. Whoa there, young filly, a deep voice boomed. Don't want to go swimming in the river, do you? I had to, I had to run straight into the blacksmith. Please, sir, I said. His enormous hands released me and I looked over my shoulder. Hmm, looking to get away from someone, I suspect, the black blacksmith said. Behind him billowed the coal smoke from the forge. The air was filled with the hot tang of metal and sweat. You're hurt, child, the blacksmith said, in need of some help. I wanted to spill out my story and to trust he could advise me, but he was a stranger. They were all strangers, and Ruth was gone, and there was blood on my forehead from the painting Madame threw at me, and she was going to have me hung, and I'd never be able to rescue Ruth, and she would be all alone. And Tell him I went north, I gasped as I picked up my skirts and darted around the forge to the south. The blacksmith called after me, but his words were lost in the din of soldiers and the sailors who cluttered my path. The wind off the river cooled my face and helped me with my decision. I would turn myself over to the rebels. I had helped them fair and square, and now it was their turn. We were all fighting for liberty. 
Ad Astra, I shouted. The words were not as magic as I'd hoped, but the door eventually opened. Colonel Reagan was sitting in a chair, a white cloth around his neck, his face covered with foamy soap and his eyes closed. Beside him stood a barber, a slave, I assumed, because of his African skin, with grizzled hair and an apron. On the table beside him stood a bowl of steaming water, a leather stoop for blades, and a cup lather with a brush in it. He turned the colonel's chin with one finger, then delicately shaved away a stripe of soap with a razor. By your leave, sir, said the sentry. I am busy, the colonel said without opening his eyes. This girl, she knew the password and insisted on seeing you, the sentry continued. The barber scraped off another stripe of soap and whiskers. Take her to Jameson, the colonel said. No, I said. The barber froze in mid-shave and the colonel opened his eyes. Please, sir, you must help me, I said quickly, as I once helped you. She sold my sister. Please, sir, I'll do anything. Just find Ruth. She's so small and... The door opened behind us, and two more sentries filed in, followed by Madame Lockton, breathing hard, and a tall gentleman I'd not seen before. My sentry waved me farther into the room so that the newcomers might all fit, and I worked my way to the open window. What is the meaning of this? The colonel asked wearily. Madame's voice cracked across the room. Are you the man in charge? Colonel sighed deeply, waved off the barber, and stood up, his face still half covered with soap. Colonel Thomas Reagan, at your service, ma'am. He bowed stiffly from the waist. How can I be of service? You have stolen my property, madam announced. We have several clerks assigned to record civilian concerns. My sergeant will show you. I will not speak with subordinates or grubby clerks. That chit of a girl belongs to me, Colonel. She has committed terrible crimes and must be punished. I demand you return her to me. The barber rinsed the razor in the water bowl. Reagan looked from Madame to me again. What did she do? She abused me most violently, sir. The colonel put his hand on the barber's place to clean towel in it. Yet it is the girl who has blood on her face, the colonel said, wiping away the soap from his chin and cheeks. Madame's eyes narrowed. Give her to me. The sentry shifted their boots on the floor. One cleared his throat. The gentleman who accompanied Madame stepped forward. The law is quite clear on this matter, sir. None of us want to live in a world where servants rule their masters. Both the Parliament and the Congress give Madame Lockton rule over her slave. A flock of crows swooped past the window, and three masted ships, sails unfurled, pushed down the river. Ruth could be on it. Or maybe she was already at sea in a dark hold with no candles. Who would feed her? Who would hold her when she was scared? The girl said you sold her sister, Colonel Reagan said. Do you mean to purchase Sal for the army, Madame asked. I'm sure she'd make a passing fine washwoman. I shall expect full payment in cash. He handed the towel back to the barber. A washwoman is the one thing I don't need right now. If you had a manservant capable of ditch digging, I'd take you up on that offer, but he paused and shook his head. I looked out the window again. One crow had come back. It landed on a carcass near the water's edge, a dead dog or a rat. The crow pecked at the meat of the thing, snatched a pink strip in its beak and tugged the piece until it broke away. He beat his wings once, twice, and flew up in the high enough to catch a breeze that rode him over the water. Another man had entered the room, and the night of my first visit to the fort he had worn his uniform coat over his nightshirt. Now his coat was properly buttoned and his breeches tucked into his boots. Thomas, we can't interfere, he said. The girl's not our concern, and you're late. We dare not keep him waiting. I looked out the window at the carcass. Please, sir, let me stay. Colonel Reagan fastened his collar without looking at me. The law binds my hands and my actions. You must return with your mistress, he said, concentrating on his task. Even during times of war, we must follow the rules of property and civilization. With that matter, the matter was concluded. Madam turned to thank the man who aided her. The sentry slipped into the hall, and Colonel Reagan picked up his hat from the table and set it on his head. As I stepped towards the window, the barber steadied me close. He shook his head from side to side, just as Jenny had back in Rhode Island 100 years ago. Bad advice on both occasions. I bolted for the open window. I almost made it. That was the end of chapter 21. So Isabel wakes up from what well, she started off as a dream and then she ends up turning into a nightmare and she realizes that the nightmare is real because Ruth has been sold, um, Mrs. Lockton sold Ruth to the West Indies to a physician's family, although I think uh, Isabel suspects that that may not be actually the truth. She uh, confronts Mrs. Lockton in the most inappropriate way um, calling her a miserable cow and shouting at her, which is really not acceptable in that time. Uh, Mrs. Lockton retaliates by, you know, hitting her over the head with a photo or a frame, uh, a painting. Uh, and then, uh, uh, sorry, Becky helps her escape by opening the door. She runs directly to Colonel Reagan, hoping that he's going to repay his debt to her after she helped him uh, with the information. 
but um, as we know in this chapter, he doesn't. Uh, he can't, his hands are tied, and he doesn't help her. Um, so I think she's feeling a little bit uh, lost right now and not sure what's going to happen next, but we know this is not good. Mrs. Lockton does have control of her again, and uh, we know she's not the nicest of owners. So. Chapter 22 from Chains by Laurie House Anderson. Wednesday, July 10th to Monday, July 15th, 1776. When I woke, the barrel of a gun was stuck, stuck up underneath my chin. Men voices shouted, boots stomped, a rain of hands grabbed at me, countless bodies, smelly breath, unwashed feet. My head fell cracked into three pieces. A woman shrieked and shrieked and she was, she was a crow shattering the air with her harsh calls. I moved, not by own, my own devices, my toes dragged in the dirt. They tried to pull my arms from my body, ripping the arms off a cloth doll. They dragged me from one place to a second place. More shouts, more shrieks, and whistles and calls, rumbling, thunder voices. They dragged me from the second place to the third place, and every voice sowing the, wi sowing the wind, all things summoning the whirlwind that would sweep us all away to drown in the deepest of seas. My thoughts would not line up like good soldiers. They swarmed a field and fled, chasing the blood that dripped from my head and stained my shift. My eyes were swolled up hard to, and it was hard to see through. Someone had stolen a tooth or two. They tied my hands together with a prickly rope. They tied the rope to the back of a cart. They tied a horse to the front of the cart. The horse lifted one tired hoof after another and dragged the cart. And the cart dragged me up the broad streets where people smiled and laughed and pointed. My eyes cast down, the cobblestones mocked too. I tried to figure out the who's and the why's of the matter, but my own name escaped me, and I knew only the pain in my head and the iron taste of lost teeth. My rememory broke into bits when they beat my head. The start of chapter 22, we see that Isabel is, it has been beat beyond belief. Um, this is, of course, Mrs. Lockton's doing. Um, she's obviously still quite upset about the reaction that Isabel had in chapter 21. Let's continue. They took me to the dungeon under City Hall to await my trial. The jailer locked me in a cell with a toothless madwoman who huddled in the corner and spat at me. She pulled her hairs from her head and dropped them into the mud. She was near bald. At sunset, the jailer came back with a cup of water and a piece of foul pork half the size of my hand. Dirty men in the other cell fought each other all night long. On the second day, we heard shouts and screams from the world above us. Then came the boom and roar of cannons, followed by the crack of musket fire and the sounds of hundreds of boots shaking the earth. Some prisoners hollered in panic and tried to pull their chains from the stone walls. The mad woman in my cell laughed and laughed, slapping her skirts. At the last noise above ceased, the jailers threw buckets of cold water on the men who had lost their senses in fear. They said for us to shut our gobs. The British had sailed their ways, their warships up the North River and had fired on the town, but now all the danger was past. Anyone who continued to blubber would feel the lash. I said not a word. The second night was the same as the first, filled with moans and mutterings, scratching and the sound of teeth and claws at rain and claw. It rained. Water poured pooled on the floor and soaked through my shoes. Rats wandered in and out of the cells, squeezing their fat bottoms through the bars. I dared not sleep for fear that they would bite me. The mad woman and the rat stayed in the corner, red eyes waiting for me all night long. On the third morning, the jailer unlocked my cell and motioned for me to follow him. The mad woman laughed again. He took me up the stairs to the courtroom. It was as big as the inside of a church with the same white walls and dark wood. The windows were of clear, of were of clear glass, grimy with neglect. They stood me behind a rail, kept my hands tied, and I shook with fever and hunger. Oi, 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 called a man in the shadows. He said more, but his words slurred together. A tall man wearing black robe, a black robe and a long wig sat at the table that was raised on a platform. He was the judge. This was a court. My head was broken, my sister was stolen, and I was lost. The woman with the crow voice, her, her, her that threw the picture at me, stood up. I raised my head to look at her, and someone picked a stick into my ribs, hard, and hissed at me. I lowered my eyes. Voices buzzed and blurred into words that I did not understand. Lockton, I finally remembered. Lockton, Madam Lockton, her that bought us, her that sold Ruth away. I kept my head down, but lifted my eyes, though they pained me. The pain was good. It drew back the curtains of my mind and forced me to pay attention. 
Madame was pretending to cry into her lace handkerchief, and, and I am but a poor woman alone, my husband having fled for reasons that I cannot comprehend. I plead with you, your honor, to assist me and to, in the correct punishment of this girl. The judge frowned and asked questions of two officers who stood near Madame. I wanted to ask about Ruth and where the blood on my shift came from and who broke my teeth, but I was the only person in the room whose hands were tied, so I kept silent. Questions were asked of the incident. Lies were given as answers. Finally, the judge said, where is the housekeeper who saw this crime, Mrs. Lockton? Oh, Becky is indisposed, sir, Madam answered. She suffers the ague. Are there no other witnesses in the event you described? A stranger stood up at the back of the room. I was passing in the street, Your Honor. I heard the commotion and I saw the girl fleeing and observed the destruction myself. There are several other people standing willing to testify, Your Honor, Madam added. Her tears had mysteriously vanished. The judge used the end of the quill to scratch at an itch under his wig. It is clear that the slave has violated the person of her master, destroyed valuable property, and attempted to run away, all contrary to the laws of our colony. State, Your Honor, reminded the lawyer. We are a state, now, independence and all that. The judge rolled his eyes. Colony, state, who knows what will be next, he sighed deeply. No matter, the girl's crime of insolence, property destruction, and running away from her rightful owner are not devious enough to warrant a sentence of death. Do you have any wishes as to the punishment that I should consider, Mrs. Lockton? Madam sighed deeply like my behavior caused her great sadness. She is a willful girl, Your Honor, with numerous character defects. I believe a permanent reminder of this day might prove the appropriate remedy. Her words stuck in the air like flies caught in a spider's web. I could make no sense of them. I could make no sense of anything. The judge scratched at his wig with a fresh vigor. You wanted her branded then? Twenty strokes of the lash would be more in keeping with her crimes. We are now led by men from Virginia, I am told, she said, land of the, my birth. I assure your honor that in Virginia we do not tolerate the rebellion of slaves. The judge nodded. Once kindled, rebellion can spread like wildfire. Do you want your husband's initials used? Madam shot a sideways glance at me. I prefer the girl to be branded with the I for insolence. It will alert people to her tendencies and serve as a reminder of her weakness. The judge picked up his gavel. So be it. Sal Lockton is, is the order of this court that you will be branded on your right cheek with the letter I in punishment for your crimes against your mistress. Crack. The gravel, the gavel cracked on the blood of, on the block of wood. Next case. So Isabel is brought to trial after being beaten senseless. Um, the judge decides that her, pun her, her crime is not deserving of being put to death. So he asks Miss Lockton what she would like to have done, and she would like her to be branded. So they are going to brand an eye into her cheek um, to remind her of her insolence. So that's going to happen in next chapter. Next chapter is 23. Chapter 23 of Chains by Lori House Anderson. Monday, July 15th, 1776. At the end of last chapter, we know that she was sentenced to have a branded eye put on her cheek. Let's see what happens in this chapter. A man pulled me by my rope outside the courtyard. After two days in the dungeon, the, the moon day sun scalded my eyes. I stumbled, but I did not fall. The man led me to the stocks, then untied my hands and pointed. I lay my head and hands into the crescents carved into the wood. He lowered the top board, pinning me in place, and secured the two pieces together with a large padlock. A brazier filled with hot coals set on the ground a few lengths in front of me. A second man stuck two branding irons into the metal basket to heat them up. My knees turned to water. I sagged against the wood. Stand up, girl, or you'll choke yourself, growled the man, locked into the stocks to my left. I couldn't turn my head enough to see him, but his voice was rough and scared. Whatever you do, don't scream, he continued. That's what they want to hear. I did not answer him, but forced my knees to hold me up. The wood locked around my neck was rough and splintering. My hands were soon without sensation, my neck and arms pricked a hundredfold by pitchforks. Two men were housed in the iron cage next to the city hall. One lay in the ground asleep or dead, the second his skin burned by the sun and peeling and missing his left ear. Starred back, stared back at me blankly. A court official, his coat covered with yellow dust, arrived with a man who wore a leather apron. He set to work pumping a hand bellows to increase the heat under the branding irons. The bellows wheezed in and out while the sun rose higher in the sky. It had rained in the night. The mud puddles scattered around the yard gave off steam like cauldrons coming to a boil. Sweat rolled off my face and I fell in great drops in the dirt below. The wind shifted and blew the smoke from the brazier into our faces. I held my breath. 
it betwixt me and the brazier dandelions grew into the mud. The man in the dusty coat pulled me into one of the branding irons out of the fire. Pulled one of the branding irons, irons out of the fire. He brought it close to his face and spit on it. The iron sizzled. My companion coughed and cursed. Take the court officials and the judge who had sentenced him. A crowd had gathered a few lengths on the other side of the brazier, mostly soldiers and tradesmen, with a few women, one carrying a babe in her arms. I thought I saw a boy with a red hat, but then I blinked. He was gone. Men at the front crowd called us names and jeered. The sunburned man in the cage yelled back, and soon the courtyard was filled with shouts and filthy language, the kind of words my mother never wanted me to say or hear. I fought against tears and lost. They fell to the dust in big drops too. If I cried a river, maybe I could swim away or slip under the water for freedom. The man in the dusty coat said something to the man in the leather apron. I could not hear him because of the noise in the crowd and the cackling co crackling coals and the beat of my heart in my ears. The men walked towards me. The dandelions were lem lemon yellow with bright green leaves and thick stalks pointing to the sky. At home in Rhode Island, the corn was tall as Ruth now. The spring lambs would be too heavy to pick up. The new goat, he'd be running headfirst into every fence post. This was a good day to bleach the wool. The man with the leather apron pinned my head against the wood. He stank of charcoal. I tried to pull away, but my hands and head were locked fast. The splinters chewed at me. Dandelions grew in the mud. The glowing iron streaked in front of my face like a comment. The crowd roared. The man pushed the hot metal against my cheek. It hissed and bubbled. Smoke curled under my nose. They cooked me. The man stepped back and pulled the iron away. The fire in my face burned on and on, deep through my flesh, searing my soul. Stars exploded out of the top of my head and all my words and all my memories followed up to the sun, burning to ash that floated back and settled in the mud. A few people at the edge of the crowd had fallen silent. They walked away with their heads down. My mama and papa appeared from the shadows. They flew to me and wrapped their arms around me and cooled my face with their ghost tears. Night crept into my soul. So in this chapter, Isabel has been branded and you can see the pain that she goes through, uh, even seeing her mom and dad's ghost in the end. She, she suffered unbearably uh, because of Mrs. Lockton. Um, we'll see what happens to her in chapter 24. Hi, so today we're gonna to read chapter 24 of Chains by Laurie House Anderson. Monday, July 15th to Sunday, July 21st. The spark kindled on my cheek, flared and spread through my entire body. First my eyes, then hair, then down my limbs, until even my toes and fingers felt they were aflame. Strange scenes swam before me, first in light, then darkness, then light again. I saw Papa, but no, not truly him, another son of Africa. Brow furrowed, his, deep, his voice deep and strong as a church bell. Mama hover, hover, Mama hovered over me, but her face faded into a woman I did not know. Older than Mama, with strands of white hair in her, white in her hair. She talked Jamaica, more songs than words, and brought bitter tea to my mouth and made the world smell of lemons and told me to sleep. I asked about Ruth over and over again and tried to apologize for letting her get stole, but the words were sawdust in my mouth. Curzon's face floated up in front of me he told me to shake my lazy bones and get out of bed. He did not turn into a dead person from when I was little. This was a strange comfort. I blinked and he was gone. The room was dark again, with starlight in the windows and the sound of a baby crying, and farther away, the barking of a lonely dog. Strangest of all was the hive of bees that had taken up residence inside me. They swarmed under my skin and gave off peculiar vibrations the buzzing echoed in my brain pan and crowded out my thoughts. The fire in me burned on and on. I woke. I did not know where I was. This was not Rhode Island or the hold of a ship or the locked in cellar or any other room in the house. It was certainly not a dungeon under City Hall. Was this a dream? Had I passed over the land of the dead? Did ghosts sleep on clean sheets that smelled of mint? I sat up. The room was warm and quiet and quite small, but entirely free of dirt vermin and mice. The walls were freshly whitewashed and the floor polished. Lace curtains fluttered in the window, though if it, through it I saw the tops of trees. This was an attic room then. The bed was softer than anything I had ever lain in, properly made up with linens, two pillows, and a coverlet of deep blue. 
A chair was positioned next to the bed and a chamber pot, empty, rested under that. I tried to stand, but the room spun around me and I plopped back down. I was wearing my shift, still stained with blood at the neckline, but my skirt, stockings, and bodice were not to be seen, or my shoes. I closed my eyes tight and then I opened them again. Same room, still no shoes. The door opened and in stepped the funny talking Dutch maid of Lady Seymour. Her eyes flew open wide when she, and then she slammed the door shut and ran away. A moment later, the door opened again and in walked the lady herself. Ah, she said with a faint surprise, you've come back to us. She poured water from the jug into a mug, handed it to me and sat on the chair. I drank down a gulp. My lips were dried and cracked and when I swallowed, it caused my burned cheek to ache. My fingers flew up to, my, to the check to check the wound, and there was a cloth stuck to my face with ointment oozing from the edges. Lady Seymour leaned forward and gently removed my hand, best not to touch it yet. The healer woman put a comfy, comfy, comfrey salve, salve, oh, sorry. The healer woman put a comfrey salve on it to draw out the pestilence. Beg pardon, ma'am, I croaked. My voice was raspy with the lack of use. But where am I and why? She glanced out the window before she spoke, her mouth set in a grim line. How best to say this, she began. I waited, not sure how to answer. You have lain here near insensible for six days. Six? Do you remember what happened? The bees threatened to overtake my mind again, their wings beating quickly. I took another drink of water. I remember some. The rest is a jumble, ma'am. You tried to run away, were beaten in the attempt. You passed two days under City Hall and emerged gravely ill with fever and heaven knows what else. After your trial, you were branded. I was not aware of these events until after they occurred. Your friend with the red hat came to the door with the news that you were near dead in the stocks. After consulting with Anne, I arranged to have you transported here. She looked directly at me. I further questioned Anne and discovered her version of the events. I find the buying and selling of children most repugnant. Your reaction to the news of your sister, while unfortunate, was understandable in my view. Ruth, 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 buzzed the bees. I blinked back tears. Do you know who bought my sister, ma'am? I have so far failed to uncover that fact. She stood up and walked to the window. My nephew's wife is stubborn as well as intemperate. I clutched at the bed covers. I will find her. She pulled the lace curtain aside and studied something passing in the street below. I thought through what she said and found a slim thread of hope to grasp hold of. Begging pardon, ma'am, again, but do I work for you now? She let the curtain fall. I'm afraid not. Anne insists that you must be returned to her household as soon as you are able. The law supports her position, I fear, and in these unsettled times there is little remedy. A wave of weariness crashed over me at the thought of serving Madame again, of allowing her to see the mark upon my face every day. I expect you'd like to bathe, Lady Seymour said. Angelica is preparing the water for you as we speak. You'll find the rest of your clothes in the kitchen. She paused in the doorway. You miss your parents terribly, don't you? Pardon, ma'am? While you were laying with fever, you spoke of them with great affection, as if they were in the room with us. She hesitated for a moment, then picked up her skirts. No matter, I will escort you back to Anne's once you've bathed and eaten. Angelica took the trouble to make the tub full and the water warm and sweet-smelling. I thanked her and she gave me a little smile. She said something Dutch in the Dutch speech, which I did not understand. We must have looked two fools, me speaking English, her talking Dutch, both nodding our heads and wishing we had the right words. My clothes had been washed and ironed, my shoes wiped clean of mud and muck. Even better was the meal of fried eggs, toasted bread, and a fruit compote of pears and apples topped with strawberries and cream. When Angelica set the food in front of me, her eyes went to the fresh scar on my face, rinsed clean of salve and patted dry. She winced at the sight. As I wiped up the last of my egg with the bread, Lady Seymour entered, followed by her cat. She had changed into a peach-colored crinoline gown and, put her, and was pulling on her lace gloves. It is time, she said. I walked two steps behind her, carrying a basket of daisies and a heart filled with dread. When we arrived at the Lockton's, we walked up the front steps without even looking back at me. She paused before she lifted the door knocker. Go on, she said. I opened the side gate to the garden, entered and closed it behind me. I heard the knocker booming under Lady Seymour's hand as I walked slowly to the back door. And that's the end of part one of this wonderful book. Isabel has gone through so much, and uh, Lady Seymour has really shown her compassionate side, uh, took her in when she, after she was branded and uh, taken with fever, and obviously showed her a lot of love and compassion that she's probably never really seen before. Isabel keeps encountering these people who look after her, 
but unfortunately she keeps being returned to the evil ones, the Lockton's. So we'll see in part two what happens and how her search for Ruth will go.